Okay, everybody, you are in for a real treat today. Um, and one of my guests, well, my guest today is on here a few weeks ago. He's back. Most of you already know him and I've heard him many times. And uh, we've got some exciting things to talk about. So exciting that he's already agreed to come back on Wednesday because uh, you're, uh, listen, I, I don't know quite how to describe this, but you're going to be super blessed. So uh, please welcome our guest today, John Haller, the John Haller. John, hi, hi. How are you? How you doing? You're on camera now. Good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's a, that's a good picture behind you. That's uh, Hebron. Looks good. The Looks ancient, good. A black and white picture of old Hebron. You know, one sometimes of my favorites, one of my favorite spots in Israel. We'll have to go there sometime. I was just going to say that I'll be there in sixty days. Are you going to go to Hebron? Uh, no, not on this trip. I'm uh, October 2023. I will be. Okay, it's a phenomenal place. You know, it's one of those places in Israel. As you know, you've been there. Uh, every trip, there's like something that really gets into you and really changes your life and your perspective about the scriptures. And for me, the last trip, it was well. There were many. We went to Shechem and we went to, uh, to Hebron, and it was just an amazing, amazing trip. That is cool. I'm looking very forward to. Uh, Hitting those places, I want to go. I want to meet Joel Kramer while I'm out there. So you should set that up. Uh, by the way, if I can recommend his uh, new YouTube channel, Expedition Bible, uh, where he goes through some of the archaeological things that he's expert in. It's yeah. a very interesting channel. I've been watching it, and uh, I thoroughly enjoy it. It's yeah. for those for anybody out there who doesn't know who Joel Kramer is. Uh, it'll be a real treat to watch. I mean, don't stop watching what we do, but, uh, right. but uh, Joel. But he's, is, he's good. He's short. I mean, he puts up like 12 minute videos. Oh, so but good. It, it, we, when we went in five years ago, just real quickly, we, Pam and I spent just Pam and I five, uh, three days with him traveling around what they call the West Bank, Judea and Samaria. And it's just, it's like, a, it was like a, three years of biblical archaeology in three days. Uh, and he's so wise. He also has a book called Where God Came Down. I would highly recommend that everyone get it. It's hardback only. It's not on Kindle. Uh, Where God Came Down, Joel Kramer. It's just, it, it, that will give you a small flavor of what we went through for three days. That is so cool. So I, I watched, uh, one of the first videos I watched with him was quite some time ago. And it was on the um, Holy Sepulchre, mm -hmm. it entirely changed my thinking on uh, that other too. site that I won't mention right now because I'll get a bunch of people mad at me. But it did, and I thought, you know, after watching that, I thought, there's just no, there's just no way it's it's the other place. So it probably just got a bunch of people mad at me for those who figured that out. Well, then but, we'll mention that he also has a view on the Temple Mount that's not the the newer view. <laughs> where the Temple Mount is too. So that'll get, that'll get even, the ones we haven't gotten mad yet, we'll get the rest of them without. <laughs> okay. Hey, so uh, John, we have a lot to talk about. By the way, sure. so here's the deal. We have so much to talk about today. We're gonna get going here. John's gonna rejoin me on Wednesday. You're about ready to find out right, uh, right now. We're gonna go into uh, Babylon. Where is it? What is Babylon? And we're also gonna be talking about Jared Kushner and the Saudis. And, uh, and friends, it's going to be a, quite a wild ride for our next little bit of time here. Tomorrow, my guest, hey, John, is Bill Koenig. Oh, okay. So One of my good can, friends. Uh, yeah, I, this is going to be an exciting week this week. So it's you today, tomorrow, Bill Koenig, Wednesday, you again. I can't wait. Oh, Olivier Melnick's joining me Thursday. Yeah, so. she, he's been at church a few times too. So. so there you go. Okay, all right, John, there is so much to talk about. Let's start off with... Um, I mean, I, I mean, where do I want to start? You know, you have MBS, right? Um, yeah. His whole view of the Temple Mount, the the Islamic claim to the Temple Mount is is changing the dynamic of well, everything going on there. Yeah. So let me let me just sort of walk through. I, I sort of sent you an outline, and I won't certainly we don't have time to get through that whole outline. But it's very interesting. So one of one of the great questions in Bible prophecy is where is Babylon the Great, this final Babylonian Empire? So there are a number of views. So I know uh, some people like Arnold Fruchtenbaum, Andy Woods, and, and a bunch of people think that Babylon 
the final Babylon will be a rebuilt Babylon in Iraq where the original Babylon was built. Uh, and I suppose that that's true. So my, my view is when I do my Bible prophecy grid, I have these ACLU, uh, acceleration, convergence, logistics and understanding. And so the rebuilt Babylon would be one where I would sort of put under logistics because for it to be rebuilt, it's supposed to be this great commercial city. And we sort of have some ideas of what great commercial cities look like today. They look like London in this world, because the Bible unfolds in a real context. It, it unfolds in the context of an existing world when it actually, all these Bible prophecies are fulfilled. So we have London, we have New York, um, maybe Paris and uh, Dubai. And Dubai is a good example. Dubai has the tallest building in the, on the planet, uh, the Burj Al Khalifa, and it's uh, over half a mile height. And that, that city, though, has taken about 30 years, maybe 35 years, to look like it does today. It's this incredible modern commercial city of about a million people. So when, when we see that the, the Revelation passages talk about Babylon being this great commercial center, you have to think that it, it's going to fit something like it is today. Now, I will also say, though, maybe not because there are... Um, we're talking, we do all this, we talk all this stuff about the metaverse and this sort of virtual reality. And 15 minutes from my house here is this giant Facebook facility. There are uh, six buildings, two are currently six, five built, one under construction, one's going to be devoted to AI. These buildings, Tom, it's very creepy to drive by them. They are about six stories tall and they are. They are like the height of the Empire State Building laying on its side in a field. Wow. They're twelve hundred. They're almost a quarter of a mile long each. So they and they're all servers. They're just big racks of servers, six stories high, twelve hundred feet long, six buildings, and each side of the each building is a million square feet of space. So there's two million square feet. So out there they have they will have twelve million square feet of servers. It's it, and this is just to process our information, the bits and bytes of our information. Across the road, by the way, Google's building an even bigger facility, and Amazon has a huge server farms out that way as well. And then the largest chip plant in the world is to break ground in the next month, just next door to the Facebook place. So we're so we're calling it the Silicon Heartland is what they're calling it mm. now. But, um. So it could be virtual. That's the virtual reality thing is changing everything. But so there's views. There's Babylon in Iraq, and there's not much that's been built there. They talked about building a port. They talked about building a big, tall building. About 20 years ago, there was a little blurb on a Washington Post blog about, hey, you know what we ought to do? We ought to move the UN to Babylon. This was around the time of the, one of the Iraq wars. I remember that. And so everybody, you know, we're all of us Bible prophecy guys, we all get excited and we all quote that and we put it in our presentations and that type of thing. So that's one possibility. Another possibility, and I have friends, Doug Krieger, Doug Woodward and others who've written a book, um, D. McGriff called, um, the final Babylon, I think it is. And they, their conclusion is looking at, the passages in Jeremiah 50 and 51, and then applying them to the world that we live in, their conclusion is that it it sounds like America is Babylon. Now, there's a few things that you can kind of criticize that view on. Maybe we don't rule the nations of the world where the most inf have been the most influential. And I think Woodward has even modified his view since that book came out about 2014. Um, there's another view, this is the one that I I just cannot get my head around, is that Jerusalem itself is the final Babylon. Um, I yeah. just have a lot of problems with that one. Uh, it, Jerusalem can't be for a number of reasons. One of them is Jerusalem is still here when Jesus comes back. Right, right. and Babylon is destroyed. Babylon is destroyed. Revelation 18 is pretty clear uh, about its destruction. But, okay... So now there's and then there's a, this new city being built called Neom, 
uh, called The Line, and I think I sent you a picture of it. Yeah, it's, I have it. Can, Matthew, can you pull up this picture for everybody to see of, of The Line? So there it is. There. Everybody can see it, John. Can you see it? So this is at the southern end of the Red Sea. Uh, that's looking from west to east. That's Saudi Arabia. Uh, there are actually two islands you can just barely see at the bottom of the picture there. Those are the, uh, this, the that open body of water there is called the Straits of Tehran, T I R A N. It's very significant geopolitically, particularly with Israel and Egypt and Saudi Arabia, and has led to some recent, very uh, current recent agreements. Back in the Six Day War in 1967, one of the things that caused Israel to launch that war was that Egypt had shut down the Red Sea to ship traffic for Israel. And Israel gets a lot of their goods through the Red Sea, up through the Gulf of Aqaba. So after the Six Day War, they entered into a treaty with Egypt. And that treaty said that Egypt would guarantee that going forward in the future that Israel, no one would shut down the Red Sea to Israel. Well, those islands really belong to Saudi Arabia. So in some recent negotiations and everything, the the Saudis, the, the islands were turned back over to Saudi Arabia, but they have to agree it. Now, Saudi Arabia, from that neon that you saw in that picture, their intent is to build one of the longest, if not the longest suspension bridges in the world across the straits there to Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt. And then Neom, the region of Neom will extend all the way up to Jordan. So it'll be a three country thing. And um, they're starting to work on it. They've already built some things like uh, important things like they have a golf course and a resort <laughs> area and some other things. And some of the meetings, if, if you remember, uh, Benjamin and Netanyahu went to Saudi Arabia before I don't know which of the last number of elections that they've had when he was still prime minister, his first prime minister to go there, and they met down in Neon. And some other, usually a lot of times, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, who's effectively the ruler of Saudi Arabia now, will have world leaders come to uh, meet him, and they will come to Neon. Um, so it's... The, that's the beginnings of Neom. So that city's supposed to be 100 miles long. Uh, each side of it will be a mirrored wall 1,500 feet high, so higher than almost any building on the planet except for three or four. And it will be about uh, 200 yards across and 100 miles long. It's been underground uh, transportation, no cars, parks, golf courses. Some of the pictures look like uh, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. So I just find this kind of interesting. I know that some of the, you know, there's a view that the Antichrist will come from the Islamic world. Um, and so I'm aware of all the different views of the Antichrist. And I'm sort of uh, the guy that I kind of keep my options open. <laughs> <laughs> that way I that way I have, pl and I haven't written a book about it, so I have plausible deniability on everything. So, and, uh, <laughs> so I... On the on the city, I want to ask you a little a little bit about. It. I've seen videos on it. Mm -hmm. um, it's fascinating. I I mean, it's the, the city itself seems like quite a stretch of the imagination of of uh, MBS. So I, I remember reading about Neom or however you say it several years ago. In fact, I did a message on Babylon and I presented <laughs> the different possibilities of what Babylon was. I think in 2013, and I think. I think Neom was around back then, at least in concept. He, he announced it in 2017 at a at a conference that um, they have. It, you know, sort of like, it's interesting. There are like three big conferences in the world. There's the Davos World Economic Forum. There's the World Government Summit. There's actually four conferences. There's the FII Institute that's done by Saudi Arabia, the Financial Investment Innovation Institute. And then there's one in St. Petersburg, Russia, which is kind of interesting when you put all the different Bible prophecy things together. And they're all very interrelated. Um, so you'll see the same people at these same conferences. So I think it was 2017 that Mohammed bin Salman announced Neon. So it's been around for about five years. And one of the things that they always said was, well, just, they'll just never be able to fund this. Uh, because it's too expensive. They're talking about it's costing half a billion or a trillion dollars. Where are they going to get the money? 
but I'm just telling you, I you know read some financial papers, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Times London, a bunch of them. They're all having ads for Neom in them right now. All you know, every week I see an ad for Neom, really? and because they're raising money. But the other interesting thing is, and this is kind of related to the World Economic Forum and the Financial Investment Initiative and the St. Petersburg thing and the World Government Summit, is uh, we have a bit of an oil crisis in the world, oil and energy crisis in the world right now. Part of that comes from, and I know you've talked about it a lot with different people and Brandon Holdhouse and others, of this ESG, environmental, social, and governments. But the two big funders of ESG movement are Russia through green groups and people like Greta Thunberg and that type of thing, and the Saudi the Saudis through the financial, the FII Institute. Um, Oh, yeah. And if you go back and you look up FII Institute, you'll see all of this ESG stuff. And part of that is, is to get those stupid people in the West to shut down oil production. So we shut down oil production to get along with ESG. And then what happens? Well, the price of oil and gas goes sky high, which is doing right now. Russia makes a lot of money and Saudi Arabia makes a okay. lot of money. So I get, I get Saudi Aramco up. made $50 billion the first quarter of this year. $50 bill. Okay, so I got to back up to a second because I don't think a lot of people have heard that. In fact, I was with Brandon Holdhouse recently, and he had mentioned that same thing mm-hmm. in, a, in one of his messages on ESGs in Russia. So right. it's, it's... Yeah, we talk a lot, Brian, Brandon yeah, and I. So you look at this... Maybe you can explain that a little bit more about Russia and the ESGs because we look at it, and you're right. People in the West are nuts and so woke that right. they, it, it's this virtual virtue signaling on pretty much everything. So now it's virtue signaling on we're going to save the planet. So essentially what you're saying is this is a Russia plant to save the planet. A Russia and Saudi plant. That's correct. It's, it's they, they have been the two oh big gosh. promoters of this. Go go look up FII Institute. Go back and look at some of their seminars. And in fact, one of the Saudi guys at the last seminar, I played a clip of him one Sunday. Or I, I did a midweek thing back in June or July on ESG and the Saudis. And so you, you can get you find that at the Fellowship Bible Chapel YouTube channel, and you can kind of figure it out. And so they push this and we're stupid enough to go along with it. And these guys are laughing all the way to the bank. Yes, they are. I mean, oh I mean, we could, we could talk all day about the crisis. We probably should mention it. Europe is in a very deep crisis. Emmanuel Macron um, who came out the other day and said, you know, he just ran for office 90 days ago. He came out and said, the era of abundance is over. Mm-hmm. And we're going to have to all make sacrifices. And he was immediately, he was also photographed the next day at one of the uh, presidential palaces in the south of France, jet skiing. So it's, you know, it's it's you guys, the air of abundance. It was his sort of Marie Antoinette moment, I think. You know, let them eat cake or let them ride their own jet ski. And, um, but Europe, the, the prices, I talked a lot about this yesterday. I, I have to tell you, it's scary, Tom. It's just very, people cannot afford the headline on the Financial Times of London website. And there are no apocalyptic, you know, website or anything like that. The front page of the Guardian, the, the head of the Financial Times said, people are going to die because of the increase in energy costs. To give you an example, Megawatt costs in the United States are somewhere around seventy to eighty dollars an hour. Uh, uh, seventy to eighty uh, dollars a megawatt. In the UK, ten weeks ago, uh, no, uh, fi- less than fifty days ago, they were they had risen from about two hundred. They're usually about three times the price in the UK and Europe that we pay here in the US. They were at 250. They went to 550. Now they're at in France. They hit a thousand. In Germany, they hit 1200. Wow, per megawatt. And it's not done. They're talking about another twofold or more increase between now and the end of winter. People cannot afford it. There are stories all over the British press and BBC. 
mother saying, I have to decide whether I'm going to heat my home or feed my children. This is uh, remarkable. It, it's a, it, it's apocalyptic. And I would recommend um, you can get a guy named Dave Walsh energy at uh, getter. He's on pandemic war room a lot uh, with Steve Bannon. He did a thing Saturday and then another thing today, but I would say, you know, if you're, if you're prone to depression, uh, being depressed mentally, don't watch it because it's, it's not the, and this came on us so quickly and it's not just, it's not the war in Russia. You can't blame Putin's war necessarily with Ukraine for this. That's part of it. Okay. But the big component of this is this ESG stuff that's been pushed by Putin and the Saudis and others who in the financial people, BlackRock and others who bought into it. So um, we're, we are in a major crisis. The financial time or the economist cover uh, for their Europe magazine a few weeks ago was a, a bear in the woods, a big black bear in the woods. It was very dark and it says Europe's dark winter apparel or something like that. And it was the Russian bear and little red riding hood in the woods. And I'm, I'm just telling you that this is the way the world is. I'm not, I, you know, I, I hear you say it. I say it all the time. You cannot make this stuff up. Yeah. This is, this is the world that we live in. This is real. And we're here. We're, we're at this point now, how does this all play into the end times yet? You know, we, we have all these theories about the horsemen, are they riding yet? Are they mounting up? Are we seeing the foreshadows and all this other stuff? Look, I, I don't know when we pronounce that the fourth horse is ridden forth, you know, <laughs> because I don't agree that it's a quarter people of the world die, but let's say that people who say that it's a quarter of the world die and the fourth horseman, that they're correct. But when do you say that this, this, when, when are people going to say that this is the horseman when uh, an eighth of the world has died, a 10th of the world, uh, three sixteenths, you know, or do you wait till all quarter of them are done? Cause it's not good. If you, if you look at the numbers, you know, 2 billion people, you know, 365 days a year times four five, six, seven years, you're talking thousands of people being killed each day. Well, not only that, John, but, Looking at two billion people, there's you couldn't bury them, right? You know, because you'd have that mean one out of every four people have to be buried. Well, it's really an impossible situation. However, you know, I know Bill well, Salas Tom, look at, has the same <laughs> approach you do on that. Yeah, well, and look, look at this uh, thing with Charlie Vector. Uh, my brother-in-law died and uh, went to Indianapolis and ran into the funeral director who was. His, his father, uh, who was part of the firm, uh, had been a partner in the law firm that I clerked at in law school back in the 1979-1980. And so I asked him, I said, what, what's going on? Is, is your business up? This is one of the largest funeral directors in that state, Indiana. And he said, yeah, we're up uh, 25, 30% over what we were a couple business, of years ago. Business is up. People are going business. down. And it sounds like over in Europe, it's going to be up a lot based on what you just said also. Hey, I, I want to clarify something for our listeners because I know they're going to comment. And uh, But it's, it's understanding why John and why Bill Salas and some other guys say that it's not necessarily a death of a quarter of the people on the planet. is because in Revelation chapter 6, when you have the rider on the, the pale horse, the fourth horseman, authority is given over a quarter of the earth to right. kill. So it doesn't say they will be killed. Later on, when you get to the trumpet judgments, you definitely have death coming to a third of the planet. But at the fourth horseman, authority to kill a quarter over a quarter of the earth doesn't necessarily mean that a quarter of the people are going to die at the fourth horseman. But, but your point, Tom, about where do you, how do you bury them? If uh, it is that yeah. many. Well, and, and we're starting to hear what, those I'm, reports about chemicals. You know, you can now use whatever acid it is to dissolve bodies. It's legal in many of the states now. And so people send well, the articles Soylent, on yeah. that and say. By the way, I don't want to. The, the movie Soylent Green. Yeah. I, did we talk yeah, about that, that last uh, time? 
I don't know, but that movie was set in 2022. That it was you. You had mentioned it was 2022, okay. and here we are. So for all of our viewers who are too young to remember what Noah Soylent Green was, it was basically people become food. That's right. The Soylent Green is people. That was sort of the last line that Charleston had his, Heston uh, uttered in the movie, as I recall. So, but, and, and I'm not saying that that movie is prophecy or anything like that, but but remember with you know, people dying over the past few years, they had, my, my neighbor was uh, a truck trailer dealer. And he said, I can't get my hands on enough reefer units, refrigerator units, because he was selling them to hospitals huh. because they were using them as portable morgues. Wow. So, uh, but, and this is all cause death. This is not just related to one particular thing. I mean, this is a, you know, Indiana insurance company came out and said the insurance company's death claims are up by 40% across the board for people ages 18 to 60, 64. They are. And you and I are not allowed to speculate on YouTube too much about what the cause. Of, uh, I, I don't, might I don't be. care what the cause is. The, yeah. the fact is that, that, you know, it, it, we know as uh, Christians, it meant, it's appointed unto man wants to die. So we know we're, uh, I, absent you know a certain intervening yeah. event that we all hope for but it, we need to understand that we live at this very <laughs> it's just becoming an increasingly unique time so anyway so we're they're shutting down in energy everywhere and that's going to have an impact and it's going to have a health impact like i don't think we've ever seen now people are hopeful uh, the big financial guru, um, I think the guy's name is Myers in the UK. He's been on saying, listen, people say I'm talking about apocalyptic or catastrophe. I'm sorry. This is a catastrophe unlike anything that I've ever seen. And people need to prepare. And it's interesting. I mentioned this yesterday and I saw people in commenting in our YouTube comments and they're saying, you know, we're setting up a pantry and a place for people to get warm in the winter at our church and that type. So Christians are out there really doing the right thing, but you need to understand we live at this world where this is going to happen. And a lot of this is pushed by the Saudis. So now the Saudis are making a ton of money. They're, uh, as I said, Aramco made $50 billion last quarter. It wasn't the first quarter of this year. It was the second quarter. And they're expected to make even more. So all of a sudden now they've got this money to finance everything like this city neom that mohammed bin salman wants to build and mohammed bin salman has said i want to build this city this this is my pyramids he wants to build something that's going to last for a very very long time so is this babylon or not i do not know okay. I know that this is in the region of the Babylonian Empire. Uh, you might put up that okay. map if Let me, you have I'm going to pull up the map in just a second, but I want to quote this. This is a quote that you sent me from the Financial Times, Correct. August 2. So what was this? Just three weeks ago, right? Yep. And this is the quote you sent me, John. The insight, and this is speaking of the line city, this neo, mm -hmm. the insight is, of course, rendered as bucolic. Is that correct? Bucolic. Bucolic techno-utopia. Techno a valley of trees and foliage, the new Babylon. Now you, now, you pointed this out before we came on air. It's fascinating how the secular news picks up on these biblical themes. This isn't coming from Bible prophecy. This is the Financial Times calling this the new Babylon. That's correct. That to me is, is, is interesting. Okay, we'll pull in, in up. The letter, to the, the letter to the editor that followed up about 12 days later, 10 days later, on August 12th, the guy said, you know, this is great, but it's a it's a techno dystopian future. And the people that live this way will be subject to the person who controls the technology. And then that brings in all the stuff that we talk about. Yuval Harari, this the World Economic Forum and all these things that we talk about. And what I'm trying to show people by this, I think, is the convergence of everything. Uh, I mean, that everything is connected to everything else. I'm going to ask you about the convergence in just a second, but I'm going to have uh, Matthew pull up the, the region map, the region of Babylon. There it is, John. Talk about that this, the, the original Babylon, the Neo, but the region of Babylon. That was the Neo-Babylonian Empire during the period of the captivity of the Jews in Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, the, the period after Nebuchadnezzar, yeah. when, Daniel was, when Daniel was around. 
and it includes you see there where the sinai peninsula is you can see that that the southern end of the sinai peninsula to the right of that is where neon is to be built now and it's so it's, just so. to the so we have the uh you have the red sea there and Correct. then looking at the sinai peninsula so i'm trying to read to the left of, of the to the left of the Sinai Peninsula is, you know, that goes up to the Suez Canal. Yeah. The right side of the Sinai Peninsula is the Gulf of Aqaba that goes up to a lot, which is where Jordan, Egypt, and Israel kind of meet there at the north end of the Red Sea. So that was all Babylonian Empire region back and at the time. And their the secondary Egyptian capital Egypt. was actually in the region area of Neom. And okay. uh, that is also the biblical areas of uh of Dedan is that area and then Sheba is the further south into Yemen do you want that map up a, also uh I don't know if we have that whole map or not if I you think, have that map yeah put I think it up we do Matthew can you put up the other map yeah that one okay as Jeremiah yeah I mean so so the the circle at the top the, you see the little line there that's the line that's neon and then uh, you see the first circle there below that is uh, Dedan and the southern circle there is Sheba. And then over to the right there, you see the Persian Gulf, uh, you know, where Qatar and yeah. United Arab Emirates and all that stuff is. So, I mean, it's in the Bibles of Middle Eastern books. I'm not, I'm not saying the Antichrist is Islamic. I, my options are open. Okay. This is, this uh, is so, f okay, I got to ask you another question. All right. So, what you're saying that you're proposing, you know, thinking of the other map, can you go back to the other map real quick? Um, so, uh, actually, you can skip the maps for a minute. Um, so what you're saying, John, is that the reality is it could be when you think of Babylon being rebuilt, the region of Babylon is where the line comes out of. Therefore, that's correct. You know, okay, now I'm going to throw something else out there. So, I mean, we're definitely going over time, but, but that, <laughs> we, we will go over time, I can tell. Okay, so you have Sheba and Dedan. Now, you proposed something also about Sheba and Dedan from Ezekiel 38, why they're protesting. Well, they, they are protesting the invasion of the North, this northern alliance that's coming down into Israel, the, the mountains of Israel. And so maybe they're sort of like, I mean, there's a they're very close relationship developing between Saudi Arabia and Russia. And again, understand. I'm not saying this is that which was prophesied, but I'm saying is you see these things being set up, and the prophecies when they full, when they go when when they happen, it's going to be in the real world. It's going to be in a world where there are people like you and I talking on YouTube about, hey, you know what? Look at what's going on over there or here or there, and we're going to say this seems like it's fitting the scriptures. And I've often said that it's a it's a difficult thing that if if we see this stuff we're we got to be careful i think there's too many people out there trying to uh spike the football a little early you know it's sort of like the guy that spikes the football at the 10 yard line and he looks like an idiot <laughs> oh, that's a great it, illustration it, <laughs> i've spiked um, it a few times in years past but i'm still there's here. a guy who did that in a pittsburgh Steeler monday night football <laughs> game and i i don't even know the guy's name because i don't think he ever played another football game yeah, again for anybody <laughs> anyway but um so I think we need to, I, think, I hate to say this, we almost need sort of like a committee of of people who know this stuff to be able to say, you know, I really think that this is that which was prophesied. Uh, because I, I just don't think it does a good job with, for people to be hanging out there by themselves. So it's out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. So, but see, so here we see this Sheba and Dedan, and we, we wonder, like, why are they protesting? And maybe they're protesting because it's they're just faking everybody out. It's it may be, Maybe they're not upset. Maybe they have some kind of agreement or an, an ulterior purpose. So then you layer on top of that sort of the other thing from this region, which is Psalm 83. And the, the sort of synergy that's going on between Psalm 83 and the Abraham Accords. Okay. Then you add on top of that the Abraham Accords, this Abraham family house is, looks like it's supposed to open in, in the next month. Uh, in, uh, is that Abu the one Dhabi. in uh, Abu Dhabi? Abu Dhabi. Okay. I think it was Pete Garcia was on here last week. We were talking about the Abraham house. I think it was Pete. I can't remember. 
I, could, I know. I could, they, all, <laughs> they're all fungible at, at some point. <laughs> so okay. So this takes us to somewhere else, and, and I, w- I want to talk about it for a minute. You know, we we I mean we've got a rebuilt Babylon. It could be this neo. We have Saudi Arabia. We got the ESGs with Russia. Okay, I want to ask you about two things. We got to get to Jared Kushner because what okay. you've written is, to me, is really is really interesting. Yeah, I, but, I started with one bullet point and I ended up with about ten. I think it, it, it was good. They're all ten were good. Okay, with the with the ESGs in Russia. So what you're saying with BlackRock and Vanguard, for example, who control much of the wealth of investments in the on the planet. Are you Not saying as much they're as they actually did a few a few months ago? But yeah, but their 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 cap their value is down a bit. But oh, it's still making, still by it's the way, still Tom, probably more than I have. In they're the invested in LNG liquefied natural gas facilities. They're making millions and millions of dollars because like billions, the price of that is they, going up. Aren't they making billions actually? Uh, it could be billions. I, I, I was trying to be kind. Okay, so with that, so BlackRock these huge corporations are actually being manipulated in the whole ESG thing because they're being used to drive a lot of the ESG. Well, I think, I think they're on board. I mean, uh, Larry, um, think, uh, think from BlackRock. I mean, I have a video of him from a couple of years ago at one of these big conferences in the middle East saying, man, you know, we're, we're trying to shape people's behaviors by what we do. (laughs) Well, he's, He's doing a remarkable job with everybody that leans left. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. So, so this is coming. So let's so let's look at this a little bit. So, um, and you should talk to Bill Caning about this tomorrow. So everybody, I'm sure that this will come up tomorrow because I've now brought it up. What's good? But be? the Trump plan for peace in the Middle East came out in early 2020. And you asked, and and I've talked to Bill about this. The Trump plan came out, and that afternoon, excuse me for saying this, all hell broke left, all hell broke loose at the White House with a crisis on a thing called that I refer to as Charlie Vector 019er. That afternoon, and that Trump plan. I don't care what anybody says, it divided the land, it proposed to divide the land of Israel, and you cannot do that. Okay. And I, you asked Bill about that. I'm he going will, to, let's talk to you about Israel it. House. I want to talk to you about it, because I think, you know, there's, there, uh, my friend David Tal, I think you you know who David is, mm-hmm. I don't think you've met him yet, but you know. I don't think I've met him. So he uh, uh, told me, he thought the, the Trump plan was a bad deal. And yep. he goes, he, he sat with me and drew a picture. He goes, this is exactly what it does. He took a he took a pen and drew it right down the middle of this piece of paper. And he said, you know, you have Israel, some Israelis think it's wonderful. Some Israelis see it for what it really is. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have, even in the Bible prophecy world, it's split. There are uh, some that's correct. who see it the way you do. I see it the same way you do, John. Uh, Andy Woods sees it this way. I believe JD yeah. does. Uh, but yep. there's other guys out there that, well, at least a couple of years ago, they thought anything Trump did was was gold. Therefore, when we do things with the land of Israel, I have to tell you a quick story. So I'm at Ben Gurion Airport in 2011, getting ready to come home. I'm it's I uh, I had not had my knees replaced. I got them replaced later that year. I was in extreme pain. I've been on my feet for four hours. I finally sat down. And I hear my flight's going to be delayed for four hours. So I make some comment to this Orthodox Jewish guy. He's actually the brother of Itamar Marcus, who runs Palestinian Media Watch. And he's standing there. He's getting ready to go back to New York. And I made some funny comment. And he says, oh, well, look at my computer. He hands me his computer. And that engaged, we then engaged in a four-hour conversation time. And one of the things he said in the conversation was, when you guys made us get out of Gaza in 2005, you had Katrina within 48 hours. You need to stop dividing our land or forcing us to divide our land because you are suffering the consequences of it. And you evangelicals, you need to be out there telling people about it. And I said, well, well, wait, I'm the guy. I do talk about it. And my friend wrote a book about it, you know, Bill Koenig. So the Jews understand this. 
the evangelicals should understand this too. And we all want peace, okay? We, we want things to be peace, but they're only going to be peace when the Prince of Peace comes. So with regard to what David Tao said with the Trump plan, and which was pushed by Jared Kushner, He's got a new book out about it, uh, about you know how great he was and all that uh, in the Trump White House. That plan is very similar to a plan that was proposed back during the Gold of My Ear um, administration called the Elan Plan. And what that Elan Plan said, we would take the West Bank areas of Judea and Samaria, we would build a road over to Gaza. And we would build a road from the northern West Bank down to around Hebron, the picture behind me. And that would be a Palestinian state, but it would be connected to Jordan. So on on June 10th of this year, the Wall Street Journal, this is very interesting how this happens. Somebody's put pulling the strings in the background, in my opinion. The Wall Street Journal and their Saturday edition or Saturday Monday edition has this huge story. It was Saturday. It was set head of Section C in the Wall Street Journal. The Jord- Does Jordan have a future Palestinian state in Jordan? Something about that. And it had a picture of King, Ab- uh, King Hussein and Yasser Arafat. And so what this would be would be, and, and then when you layer, so you take the Elan plan, and you and you make a transparency of the Trump plan and lay it on top. It's the same thing. The only thing the Trump plan didn't do that it didn't mention Jordan. So, on July eighth in Al Arabiya, a close confidant of Mohammed bin Salman writes an article in a Saudi paper titled "The Hashemite Kingdom of Palestine." This is Mohammed bin Salman the guy who's building this Babylonian-like thing in Saudi Arabia, his proposal for a peace plan in the Middle East. And it's just another version of the Trump plan. Now, look, David Tao sounds like a very intelligent man because he's exactly right. You can draw a line down the middle and you can see that essentially what the plan does, the Trump plan did this and the Elon plan did this, and the new Hashemite Kingdom of Palestine plan does this. It gives the watershed to the Arabs. And it's it's insane. But there, you can go to Arat Shiva. You can read articles, probably half a dozen articles by David Singer, who identifies himself as a Zionist, pro-Israel. But he's been pushing for something like this for a while. Now, I don't know how much yeah. traction it's getting in Israel. All I'm saying is... This is part of this convergence of all of these things going on. So here you have this, you have the the oil crisis, Saudi Arabia making money. You have him now starting this Babylonian type city. And maybe this isn't Babylon, but maybe this is the template for Babylon. Okay. That that's a possibility. I'm, I'm open to that, but you see this happening and coming together at the same time, you have this guy pushing this peace plan. And then you layer on top of that, the Abraham Accords, by the way, the Jared Kushner drafted peace plan for the Trump administration, Trump's vision for peace, whatever it was called, 2020. Then you have the Abraham Accords on top of that. And the Saudis are kind of on the margins of the of the um, Abraham Accords. They, They haven't joined on yet. They've made it very clear. We've got to resolve the Palestinian issue if we're going to be part of the Abraham Accords. And now, so here you have a frail king who's not in very good health. He's in his well into his 80s. And his son, who is the new crown prince of Saudi Arabia. By the way, he's very close friends with a guy named Jared Kushner. And by the way, when Trump, I was in Israel when Trump went there in 2017. And before Trump came to Israel, he went to Saudi Arabia. And it was very unusual because Nobody had ever really done this before, fly from Saudi Arabia to Ben Gurion to, to Israel on a diplomatic mission. It just it just hadn't been done. And at that time, by the way, Mohammed bin Salman was not the crown prince. He became the crown prince about two or three months after that meeting. But he's always been very close to Kushner. So Kushner's pushing 
the Trump plan. He's pushing the Abraham Accords. And now you have the ESG stuff from Saudi Arabia taking hold and causing energy prices to spike all over the world, energy shortages, which are only going to increase the prices. And Saudi Arabia is sitting there. Yeah, well, we'll pump oil. You now we don't really want to, but you know, you need it. So we'll pump oil and gas. Now you have an alliance too, Tom. At the same time, you have this alliance between not just Russia and Saudi Arabia, but Russia and Turkey and Iran are meeting. <laughs> and Russia and Iran just entered into this big $40 billion thing between Russia's Gazprom and whatever the Iranian company is. And now the reports are coming out that their goal is to create a gas cartel to control the gas of the world. <laughs> this is, John, this is truly- If it, I wrote this in it, a novel, nobody would buy it. Uh, it's it's just amazing say, to, to put all this together. Okay, so here's the story. Uh, we've got 40, my goal today is to make you cry. We've no, got, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we've got 45 minutes. So I, on Wednesday, I'd like to pick up here. I want to get back to Kushner. I okay. want to get back to MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, who's running everything because uh, the king is, all, is very frail. Uh, he's the one behind Naomi. He's the one behind all these things you're talking about. We're, we got Russia, Turkey, and Iran to talk about. Gazprom to talk about. I want to talk about MBS and also his thoughts of the Temple Mount, and oh yeah, um, that's it. It is to me, it is huge. And I remember reading a tweet. It was some time back that came out of Saudi Arabia. No mm -hmm. way it would have made it public unless it was approved. And it was uh, it was very fascinating about the Temple Mount and yep and uh, that Al Aqsa Mosque isn't really important to Muslims. That's right. And, and uh, there's one guy in the world that seems to be willing to go down that road, and it's MBS. If, if, if this, whole, this whole thing is absolutely fascinating. At a time while we have Biden, the most inept person on, on the planet, uh, uh, with as the face of the United States. Ready to make a deal with Iran that every expert in the world says will result in Iran getting a trillion dollars between now and 2030. Oh. And, and the, the other thing, why is everybody using 2030? Everything is 2030. Have you noticed that? 2030, except for the Deagle report, which I talked about last night, which is 2025. Oh. Yeah, they think we're, they won't, we won't be around. And maybe they're right too, so who knows? <laughs> okay, Wednesday, we have a lot to talk about. Do, yep. do you have enough time for two questions? Sure, sure. Okay, everybody, if you could send, just we'll go for two questions. Um, uh, if you got them, send them in. Um, I'll wait as long as I uh, as I possibly can. By the way, somebody on here says you have an awesome mind. So there you go, John. Okay, this one is from David Wendell. What is my your wife's take not listening? But I want you to know that. I, I know. She <laughs> what this, David Wendell? What is your take on the war going on this moment in the Middle East? Well, you know, there is a war going on. Uh, it, again, it's a lot of proxy wars, and it's kind of under the radar. Um, you know, the, the U.S. has been attacked in northern, northeastern Syria in the region of Dar al Zor, which is the wheat growing and oil producing region of Syria. And the Russians don't like us there. The Iranians don't like us there. And we still have a small, I don't think we have more than a couple, maybe two, I think it's under 2,000 people there. But there's a lot of things, rockets and drones and that type of thing going back and forth. So it, the, the point of all this is that. Uh, you know, we can also talk about the gas fields off the coast, which you know something about because you were there at the Lebanon border. And that's a hot thing, too, because Hezbollah is saying, don't you dare drill anything out there. You don't drill anything in the Palest what they call the Palestinian Sea, not the Mediterranean. So what, what you have is, again, you have this convergence of everything where it's like a hair trigger. You know, you know, Amir Vivi, and, and he says this. When this thing unwinds, it's going to be, it's going to be unbelievable. Like when the rockets start flying from it is. Lebanon down towards Israel. Somebody just asked me about that yesterday after church, and I said, um, the because uh, they watch all they watch all of us, and uh, I said, listen, these things are hot over there. They've been hot over there as long as I've been read. As if you go all the way back to the time of the Bible, they were hot over there. I said, it's just a matter of time before something blows, though. It will. 
it, it, the day yeah. will come. You can think back to World War One. You know, the the trigger there was the Crown Prince of the Austrian Hungarian Empire being assassinated, and his he and his wife being assassinated in Sari Evo, um, in in 1914. And within months, the world was at war. Now, the U.S. stayed out of it for a few years, but we eventually got into it. And I I don't know that we've ever really solved since World War One since that trigger event. I don't know that there's ever really been peace in the world. Uh, at any point. So we're 100 and what, 108 years past that. But there's, I, I see all these things happen. And I'm like, is that the, tr is this the trigger event? What's the trigger event? I don't know what that is. So I'm sort of looking for that. And I'm just saying is we've talked about 15 things today that could be the trigger event. Yeah. And we only scratched the surface. I it, know. it is interesting. And I'll get into this a lot tomorrow with Bill Koenig, but ever since the Trump the Trump peace plan, this world has been an absolute mess and it has not stopped. And so, this thing's you know, still on the table. I, I looked it up. I was at your church five years ago with Bill Salas on a Sunday night. And, um, you know, then we had some stuff to talk about, you know. Now we could do like a whole weekend of just current events. Oh, you I do current events like every day. I know <laughs> all you day do. long. <laughs> and I could too. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's sort of over. How do you, how do I, I'm trying to organize it into some kind of coherent thought because there's about 80 rabbit trails on everything that I look at. Well, you've connected some things in a marvelous way today. I can't wait till Wednesday. <laughs> we pick up with these things because, and tomorrow with Bill Koenig will be exciting too. Okay. Last question is uh, this person said, a real talk right now said, I was taught Babylon and Revelation was not literal. I have, I, I believe a lot of people that were taught Bible prophecy wasn't literal, but even in Bible prophecy circles, people still spiritualize Revelation chapter 18. Well, I mean, there, there's a spiritual aspect to it, but it's, it's also unfolding in a real world. So you know, when I see things like uh, Great Harbor and the smoke of her burning and all of that stuff, it I think it's talking about a, a literal real place. Now, the thing is, we need to figure out where that place is. And then I mean, we can we could go down to, uh, you know, how some of the Babylonian priesthood ended up in Pergamum and they created this altar there to Zeus that ended up in the Pergamum Museum on Museum Island in Berlin, where, by the way, they're just about ready to open a thing called the House of One, which is a house of faith for Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And so, and, and you see that altar thing from Pergamum, I did a talk on this many years ago. Well, I've done a lot of talks on it, but that altar was the inspiration for the Nazi viewing grounds at Nuremberg. Wow. Albert Speer went to the Pergamum Museum and saw the Zeus altar that they kind of reconstructed in the museum there, which by the way, was closed for about six years. It just reopened recently. So I'm just saying is there's, you're right. You know, early 2020, when everything hit, when the Trump plan came out, Bill will talk about that tomorrow sure because he's well versed in it but i say this at the beginning of each year my update and so the first update i did in 2021 was how long are, how far are we going to be into 2021 where we before we wish for the good old days of 2020 yeah in the beginning of 22 i said so how are we going to how long before we wish we were in the good old days of 2021 and that's just the reality that we're in. I mean, and the answer was about about a week. You know, we were wishing for the good yeah. old days of the prior year. So I'm already starting to think I'm wishing for the first six months of 2022. So, uh, hey, it's uh, crazy. It is. John, thanks for joining me today. Thank I you, look Tom. forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Hey, listen, everyone, be sure to download the app, the Hope for Our Times app. We have news on there. We have the Bible on there. The whole Bible is on there. We have updated news on there. We have all of our videos are there amongst other videos also when I get around to posting my friends' videos. And uh, 
Uh, we have all of our events are also posted on there. So check it out and uh, see you tomorrow back here. Bill Koenig is going to be my guest. It's going to be uh, rocking and rolling time tomorrow and Wednesday again with John. Thanks for taking time out of your busy day, John. I appreciate it Thank very you. much. All right. God bless. See ya. Bye, everyone. Bye.